Isaiah chapter 7 and Isaiah chapter 9. There will not be on the overhead. I wanted to make sure we stripped everything down this morning and just kind of had a, of a more intimate kind of a feeling today. But Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Isaiah 9, 6 says, For a child is born to us, a son is given to us. The government will rest on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I'm going to pray one more time. Father, thank you for the amazing privilege to worship you today as we celebrate the giving of your Son. Please anoint our words. Anoint me as I deliver your truth to these people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Christmas time is one of the most stressful times of the year because it brings out a lot of uh, painful memories and painful wounds in the past. And so what we've been doing is talking for the last few weeks about how do we overcome the ghosts of Christmas past. Now we're not talking about a Christmas carol. We're not talking about Ebenezer Scrooge. But we are talking about the ghosts of the past that seem to be brought up to the surface this time of year. There's always that one family member who is fighting with another family member at a house. And when you put the two of them in a room together, it can get interesting. Who's been there at least one time? Amen. Or... Somebody shows up, and all of a sudden those hurts that you had when you were a child, because they got the stocking that you wanted when you were eight years old, all of a sudden comes back up because they always got what they wanted, and you always got second best. And not that I'm speaking from experience, but I'm just saying. <laughs> There's always somebody that seems to squeeze you a certain way, and what comes out isn't always the most fun. So we're talking, we're talking about how to overcome the ghost of past offenses. We talked last week about overcoming the ghosts of past shame. But today I want to talk about overcoming the ghosts of past labels. Ghosts of Christmas past labels. I love Christmas stories. And every year we get together and we talk about uh, some of the past Christmases that we had. Especially when we, one Christmas, 13 years ago, Pastor Shannon, we were rushing into the hospital because Dominic decided to come almost two months early. Great, fun Christmas memory. I remember one time when Raquel was a little girl, and we didn't have a fireplace. And so she had to have a stocking. So what we did was we put her stocking on top of the refrigerator with a stocking wig. I tried to hammer it with a nail, but she wouldn't let me. So I had the stocking wig on the refrigerator, and Raquel just knew Santa was going to come early. So she was checking that stocking every 15 minutes, Five starting at December 20th, every day, she's checking, checking, checking. And I finally said, Raquel, if you pull that down, it's going to come and hurt you. Don't pull the stocking down. There's a week. So we're watching TV. We're getting ready one night to, to put her to bed. And all of a sudden, we hear this crack. And I went in, and she had pulled the stocking down, sure enough. And it landed on our tile, cracked it. And I looked at her and yelled, Raquel. And she looked right at me. She said, oh, help me, Jesus. One of my fun Christmas stories. But one of the ones that we never, ever, ever let my grandma off the hook on this one. Every year we remind her of it because that's what grandkids do. She decided to help wrap all the gifts. But when she was done wrapping all the gifts, she realized she had forgotten to put name tags on any of them. So that year at Christmas, we had a tree full of presents with no names on them, and we had to guess. So what happened was, is everybody got a gift. We all opened them at the same time, and then we had to just pass them out. Now, my grandma tried to guess what was right, but the labels were all wrong. <coughs> Have you ever had somebody put a label on you that was wrong? And maybe the label on the outside didn't match what was on the inside. See, labels hit every single one of us. It's really a part of life. From the time our children are growing up, they are labeled. When they go to school, you have to label them. What are you? What's your ethnic background? And some people, they don't know. 
Sometimes you get labeled based on socioeconomic classes. Sometimes you get labeled based on where you live. But labels are a part of life. Whether they're good or bad or earned, labels come to all of us. Learning, though, how to handle these labels can really determine how high you can grow, how high you can go in your spiritual walk. Think about sometimes the labels that we face. Clumsy. Awkward. Arrogant. Confident. Cowardly. ADD. Dyslexic. Disorganized. Or this person is just not good at blank. Cooking. Sharing. Working. And these labels attached to all of us. Have they ever sounded familiar to you? If you're not careful, that label will put a lid on your future. But if you really want to overcome anything in life, you're going to have to deal with that label. Clint Eastwood was once told, you'll never make it as an actor. You've got a chip in your tooth, you talk too slow, and your Adam's apple's too big. You'll never make it. Richard Branson, he is dyslexic. Label, dyslexic. He'll never be able to learn correctly. Well, he learned enough to be the key developer at Virgin Records, becoming the fourth wealthiest man in the UK. Joe Lewis, famous boxer, in his first fight, he was knocked down six times in three rounds and was labeled by one sports writer a doormat with no future. Charles Schultz, who created the Peanuts characters, <laughs> he actually um, couldn't get a job with Disney because he did not have any talent. Labels get placed on all of us, whether they're fair or not. So we're going to have to learn how to deal with them. And sometimes those labels are not nice, but labels limit usefulness. Let me say that again. Labels limit usefulness. Because they try to define you and put you into a box. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be defined by one area in my life. I don't want somebody to take a look at me and I have a bad day and then forever I'm labeled by that moment. I mean, picture Thomas, the disciple. We know him as Doubting Thomas. Why? Because he failed one day. One day. Peter denies Christ. We rip on him for walking on water and sinking. At least he walked on water. We watch one scene of the movie and we think we can judge the whole thing. But can I tell you, God wants you to break free from that. Like the Bible tells us in 3 John 2, Dear friend, I'm praying that everything prosper with you and that you be in good health as I know you are prospering spiritually. Sometimes we've got to break through that label. And when that outside label doesn't match the inside, we've got to figure out how to deal with it. Because not everybody puts a bad label on you. Sometimes you place a bad label on yourself. Sometimes the right label is on you, but for whatever reason, we fail to live up to some kind of an expectation. And what is on the outside still doesn't match what's on the inside. It reminds me of uh, one of the disciples. His name was Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. He was hated. He was Jewish, he was Jewish, with a Greek name, <clears throat> hated by the Jews, not fully accepted by the Romans, a man really without a country, without a home. The reason I talk about him being important, though, is because Matthew wasn't his real name. His real name was Levi. And he's mentioned in three Gospels. Three. Are you Matthew? Well, hi. <laughs> Matthew's real name was Levi. When he was born, his parents wanted him to follow suit in the priesthood. They had high dreams, high hopes for him. But somewhere something happened where he failed. Like all children, he would have grown up and have been moving forward into, in, into his future and his destiny. 
See, a name means something in, in, in the Jewish culture. And it should mean something today. See, when his parents named him Levi, they had a dream for him to be a priest. Pastor Shannon's sister's pregnant, and she's due, uh, she's going to have a child at the end of March, early April. And we're working on names. Nobody wants to name their kid Judas. Nobody wants to name their girl or daughter Jezebel. Right? You usually don't want to see, you don't see girls' names Bathsheba, even though it wasn't her fault. Come on. You want a strong name. Like Leonard's name. Where's Leonard at? His name means lion-hearted and brave. You want to have a strong name like Kevin. Who's kind and gentle and handsome. I don't think that would actually work with there. <laughs> my name means the one who passed from the dark side of the river or the one who came from death to life. And my whole life has been about bringing people from death to life. In fact, the Lord spoke very clearly to me when I was asking the Lord what kind of direction in ministry. He said, Kobe, wake the dead. Wake the dead. So my whole life is wrapped around that because my name set me into that motion. Does that make sense? So when his parents said, you are a Levi, they were determined to have a priest. Which means that when he was a child, he went to his school and that he was supposed to. Beth Sefer from 6 to 10 years old, the house of the book. He went to school five days a week. And by the time he was 10, he had memorized the entire five books of the Torah. Line for line, word by word, by the time he was 10. Then he went to the next round, if he was good enough, and he, it was a bet midrash. And this is where he was around, the, you know, our bet Talmud, 10 to 14, house of learning. And this is where he would grow deeper and deeper into the things of the faith. He would have the remainder of the scriptures memorized. We see Jesus in that stage where he's asking questions in the temple. Somewhere, though, he fails because he missed going into Bet Midrash where he was picked up by a rabbi to be trained. See, only the best of the best could go on. So here's a young man who has dreams of being a priest, somehow not being good enough. He was labeled priest. His name is attached to God. And yet, he wasn't good enough to be attached anymore. No, no rabbi wanted him. Nobody wanted to keep teaching him. He, he failed. He, he wasn't good enough. And so what happens when the outside label doesn't match what's on the inside, sometimes you run very, very far away from it. And you see people who have their heart broken in the relationship turn and go off the deep end and they try to break as many hearts as they can. You see somebody who messed up and got maybe involved in drugs go way off the deep end in drugs. You find somebody who once messed up. I'm going to be careful because I know children are here. I feel I'm dirty anyways. It doesn't matter. I won't let that be the only person that hurts me. Are we talking to Will? And that's exactly what Levi does. Levi changes his name to Matthew. From attached to God, to God's gift. Ever met somebody who thought they were God's gift? Matthew actually named himself that. Until the one day, Jesus walked by. Pastor, what in the world does this have to do with Christmas? Everything. Because Emmanuel walked. Not God looking down on us. Not the big guy in the sky. Not the big man upstairs. God with us showed up and walked into his world. And in that moment when Jesus walked into his world, his life changed. You shall call him Emmanuel. Friends, when you get the right label with the right person, anything is possible. Let's take a look at some of Jesus' labels. We've already talked about one is Emmanuel, God with us. He's not the God who watches you. He's the God who's with you. He's the God who stood there in the flames. 
with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was the God who walked with man. He was the God who was there, fire, leading them through the wilderness. He was the God who was with them, step by step. Not distant, not far. And you know what's even greater than that? Is that Jesus was with them, but the Holy Spirit is in us. That's an amazing thing. The next thing, the next label that we get from Jesus is a wonderful counselor. That means something uncommon and out of the ordinary. It reflects the phenomenon that's lying beyond our human understanding. The Bible says that his ways are not our ways. And his thoughts are not our thoughts. So when he comes to give us counsel and to give us guidance, it's otherworldly. It's not human wisdom. Why do we need his counsel? Because really our hearts are sinful. Because we're broken. His job is to come in and to guide us where we need to go. To give us the advice that we need in our marriages. He says, I'll send the comforter. I'll send the next one. He'll lead you and guide you into all truth. Isaiah 28, 29 says, This also comes from the Lord of the hosts. He is wonderful in counsel and excellent in wisdom. What else does the Bible call him? What are the label? How about mighty God? Not a wimpy God. Not a good God. Not a big God. Almighty God. That means he's all powerful. He is strong. He is mighty. And he is invincible. He alone is worthy to be our hero. Because he defeated sin. He defeated death. He's defeated the devil. He's defeated the grave. He has defeated eternity. He is the almighty God. His name is Jesus. And since he's God, and he's the almighty God, especially today at Christmas, he deserves our absolute reverence, our genuine faith, and our supreme love. To reject Jesus is to reject God himself. And to reject God is to reject life. Because another label he has is he's our everlasting father. Isaiah said, have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He is not eternal. Therefore, all that he provides extends into eternity. God is eternal. Therefore, every promise endures for generations. God is eternal. Therefore, His purposes for His creation remain everlasting. He is eternal. There is no end and there is no beginning. He is what He is. Not so with us. We do have an ending, at least here on the earth in our flesh. And there will come a day when we're going to have to decide, is he really going to be our father? Will we receive that, love, that, that label from him? But pastor, how in the world is he our everlasting father? Isn't God the father of the father? This is the son. Well, think of it like this. The Bible says in John that all things were made through him. And without him was not anything made that was made. In other words, he is the originator of life. All things come from Him. Therefore, that's how we look at Jesus as being that Father, eternal Father for us, or Father of eternity. But I love this next one. And that is the Prince of Peace. In a world that's chaotic right now, and in a world where there doesn't seem to be much peace, we see ISIS putting hit lists together, telling it, members and followers and those allegiant to them to go and attack churches today. doesn't show up in the news, but it's there. We're seeing children sacrifice. We're watching the world go in turmoil as they're turning its back on Israel. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of peace. 
Can I tell you the only way to truly have peace on earth is through Jesus Christ. And he is the prince of peace. He gives us peace with God, that's spiritual peace. He gives us um, peace of God, which is emotional peace. He gives us peace with others, relational peace. The word is shalom. Peace. Balance. Everything the way it's supposed to be. So when all of a sudden Emmanuel shows up in Levi's world, God shows up as Emmanuel, comes in as the Almighty God saying, I don't care about your past. I care about your future. I'm here to restore the peace and the torment that made you change your name. I'm going to now lead you, guide you. The rabbi that turned his back on you, I won't. Come follow me. In that moment, Levi turned Matthew, accepted a new label. He became a Jesus follower that day. What happened to him? I don't know. He just became one of the 12 disciples. Rejected. By his family, by his people, by himself. Friends, I don't know what label play, people have placed on you. It may have been completely unfair. Somebody saw you in a very dark time and you're nothing but a divorcee now forever. You had a bad day at work, lost your job, and now forever you're labeled work fragile. You got angry one day and somebody saw you in public yelling at your kids and you're forever labeled anger management prospect. Some of you deserve the label you got. But can I tell you, your past is not as big as God's power. And you can have a new label. And that is one that is attached to Jesus. Shalom, why don't you come forward? Jesus wants to give you that opportunity. Especially this Christmas season. I heard somebody say, but well, Christmas is about family. No, it's not. It's about Jesus. It's about presents. No, no. It's about Jesus. The ultimate gift that God gives us is the opportunity to be reconciled with Him. To take that label of sinner off and put a new label of forgiven on. But Pastor, I'm still messing up. You're going to. You know what's funny? We're the only people shocked when we sin. God's not shocked. That's why he sent Jesus to take care of it once and for all. But Pastor, what if I sin tomorrow? Jesus already died for it. You mean Jesus has already forgiven my sins in the future? All your sins were in the future when Jesus died. The question is, what do you want your label to be? Broken or restored? Failure or forgiven? Every saint has a past. Every sinner has a future. And Jesus himself shows that anybody's welcome. Tax collectors back then were viewed upon worse than tax collectors and IRS agents now. You can imagine the kind of life this guy had. There's no amount of money that can fix that thing. So anyone can come. Anyone's welcome. Tall, short, skinny, fat, smelly. And I say those because sometimes you get so stuck on who's allowed to come into church and who's not. Anyone can come. Anyone. Somebody with a bad sexual past? Anyone. Ex-con? 
anyone. Inmate, anyone. <clears throat> Recently divorced, anyone. Legalist, anyone. Alcoholic, anyone. Pothead, anyone. Addict, anyone. Hallelujah. Hypocrite, anyone. There are no qualifications that you need to come to Jesus. And you know what that means? It also means there are no excuses to not come there. Because it's anyone who can come. But it costs you everything. This morning, with everybody's head bowed and eyes closed, I want you to think about the label that you may have on your life right now. Maybe it's a label somebody placed on you. That was unfair. You were a little wild in your teen years. You did some silly things. You've been labeled and you can't shake it. Jesus is about to walk by. Some of you been misjudged. You're an introvert and people label you stuck up. You're really organized and they called you a control freak. You got bad news, blew up somebody, and now you're a hothead. Forever. The Emmanuel is walking by. Some of you, somebody had a dream for you. It was a dream that was a good dream. But you failed to live up to it. Somewhere you screwed up. And you feel like the dream is over. I could never serve the Lord. If you knew my past, I'm not good enough. That's exactly who Jesus went after. They're not good at us. But if you knew who I was when nobody was watching, Pastor, you wouldn't be so quick to say Jesus can forgive me. Sure I can. Because it doesn't matter how far you've fallen from Jesus. It doesn't matter how far you've gone away. He offers you a gift of a new label which is redeemed. Oh yeah, that label on the outside may not always match what you feel on the inside. But that's where the Holy Spirit begins His work. I just want to give everybody an opportunity before we take communion to make sure they got the right label stuck on them because Emmanuel is here. Emmanuel, God with us, offers you peace for those whose lives are in turmoil. He offers you counsel for those who are really right now at a crossroads in your life. Some of you, your God has been way too small. He's the Almighty God. Some of you think, I have no purpose, I have no meaning, I have no reason. If there's no reason, why should I even live anymore? And you may be actually thinking about taking your own life this holiday season. You need the Father of eternity. You need to hear this. You're not a mistake. You're not an accident. Jesus died for you. That gives you value and worth. I'm just going to say a prayer. If you wouldn't mind, everybody in this room... Repeat this with me. Because I want to make sure that if people need to get right with Jesus, with Emmanuel, that ultimate gift, what I call the ultimate weapon of mass destruction, the Bible says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. What a gift. What a gift. 
if you want to get a new label, will you just say, Jesus, I want a new label. One that says forgiven. One that says redeemed. For the rest of my life, I'm going to follow you. I'm sorry for the way I've lived. But I'm not going to live that way anymore. Thank you for my future. In Jesus' name.